every test is satisfied in a good way. You look at the sequence, um, because it's a sequence of abstract objects, of operators, a sequence of functionals, you let it act on individual elements. And each time you watch it, you see there is convergence. That's a very reasonable concept. So that, that's more or less. But I want to wait with the official start with prof until Professor Rada is here. Maybe I can skip this one. So, uh, yeah, another thing is these plots are all done with MATLAB and clear enough uh, such a figure is very easily plotted in a complex plane. You need just five points, start with one point, connect this point, this point, this point, this point, and put the end point at the beginning, then you have a closed curve. Uh, and when you rotate by 90 degrees, it's just multiply with i. So, so my Fourier algebra is plotted as i times my sequence of five uh, complex numbers arranged in the right way of broadness and, and, and so, uh, and multiply with i. And everything has been adjusted. I mean, this was a little bit playing around the Wien algebra. The green guy is, is my Wien algebra. Locally, it's like C0. C0 was this rectangular box containing the the FL1 algebra, so that would be also in between here. And uh, so locally it's like the, the C0, globally it's stretched like this, but it should of course be inside L1, it should be inside L infinity and so on. That's why we had to, to make these arrangements. Yeah, and, and also uh, clearly th this little corner had to be uh, created because I know that, of course, again, the box function is, is a harmless function. I mean, it's in, uh, in W L infinity L1, so it's bounded. If you take the maximum, it's just the upper rim and in sum, it's maybe two boxes or three boxes or so, that's finite. But it's clearly not in the Fourier algebra. So these guys are not in the Fourier algebra, but they're inside the green space, which for me is more or less Wien algebra, or if you take, you, you skip continuity, it's L infinity. And you can ask actually, what is, is W L infinity L1 a dual space? And then uh, you can ask, well, ca let us write it in the, just for exercise, let us write it as W L infinity little L1, because that's really what you're doing. You're measuring blockwise or so. Are the components dual spaces? So I'm asking you, is L infinity a dual space? The answer is? Yes, it's the dual, it's the dual of L1. Second, more interesting thing, L1 is not reflexive, but it's still a dual space. What is uh, L, uh, L1 a dual of? And then you come up, it must be C0. So uh, the C0 space globally and the L1 space locally uh, are a space which is well defined. So I can say, I take uh, within L1, no, within the locally integrable functions, I take the ones where I measure the L1 norm here, and here, and here, and here. That's how I start to, to define amalgam spaces. If you give me a general local integrable function like constant 1 or x squared or so, it will blow up. But then I measure the pieces, and if they go down, I'm saying that's in this Wiener amalgam space W local L1 C0, and the dual space is exactly W L infinity L1. If I take the closure of the test functions, I'm getting W, C, uh, I'm getting L infinity L1. And if I take the closure in that space of test functions, I'm getting the continuous elements and that's the mean algebra. Okay, so. Uh, I'll give you this more complete picture. And then the question is, are we ready? Yeah, okay, so. Welcome to our next uh, session. Uh, my plan for today is, and I hope I can get uh, the message over to you, to talk a little bit about Banach frames, uh, re-spaces, and banach gelfan triples. So the idea of this banach gelfan triple will be essentially the idea uh, that I have tried to explain in the MATLAB session already. We have vector spaces. And in these vector spaces, we have, uh, of course, linear mappings, and they have range spaces, and sometimes the range spaces. Everything we say, the columns of, a, of the matrix generate the space. Sometimes the synthesis mapping is injective. We say the columns are linear independent. Now somehow we would like to decorate this. We do this in Hilbert spaces, 
But Hilbert spaces alone are not good enough, I would say, even for practical applications. One should always have all the other spaces around. Now, already taking a little bit uh, away from the motivation, I would say, if you think of the abstract Hilbert spaces, then we know that in every ab abstract Hilbert space, let's say in every separable Hilbert space, you can create an orthonormal basis. So, whereas you say every finite dimension Hilbert space going to a basis is isomorphic to Cn, you can now say even if it's a space with scalar product, you can move it isomorphically to Cn with this color product, with angles and so on. And so if you have a separable infinite dimensional space, the statement about Hilbert spaces, you have an isomorphism to the infinite, dimen infinite dimensional Euclidean space. All the sequences which are potentially infin infinitely many coordinates but with finite Euclidean lengths. And that's what we call L2 and we do more or less what we are doing in R3 geometrically in all these Hilbert spaces. Now, the Hilbert space is nice and very important and every functional is represented by a scalar product with some vector, the Ries representation theorem. But sometimes you need larger things. We have seen the pure frequencies are not decaying at infinity. And when we want to sum up some expressions which uses bounded sequences, we're not decaying at infinity, we need L1 conditions. So suddenly we have seen also LP, LP prime duality. If you have functions and they are not both in L2, you may still have a very meaningful interpretation of this color product by a balanced viewpoint. And sometimes we balance it this way, then we approximate and the weak star then we go that. So this, you remember my slalom uh, game, little epsilon equation help us to understand what's going on in the general situation and using this or that or that at interpretation. I mean, if somebody writes to you summation of xk with yk, and you have, uh, let's say, two finite sequences, meaning all the others are zero. Infinite sequences a priori or so. And then you start thinking, well, should I take it as a two scalar product? Or should I take the finite pieces and say that's the scalar product in Cn? Or should I say that's the duality between Lp and Lp prime? Or maybe even Lp prime with Lp? And the good thing is, you don't have to care. It's always the same. So I think it's important to say, don't look at the function spaces, at the sequence spaces individually, but say you have a family and always you have an extension. And if somebody tells you, I have a scalar product of constant one with constant one, you will say, probably this is not, uh, not good because it explodes. So uh, if you pair, either both of them are equal quality L2 or they are fitting, but in the course of a computation, the interpretation will change. I, I localize constant one to something compact and then I can use another interpretation. Then I can take a Fourier transform because I use Planchorel. Then I do another interpretation and so on. That's really what we want to do. So somehow uh, two aspects were this Banach Gel von Triple, and I have already introduced as zero comes in, is uh, the situation of function spaces that we have so far. I've chosen here for this plot more or less the colors that I use most of the time, where uh, a zero, L2 yellow, and a zero prime are represented as three circles, <coughs> and we will concentrate on this. But I have also inserted uh, the amalgam space, the Wien algebra more or less, which is locally like C0, so uh, that's why I made it flat, and globally uh, uh, like, like the L1 case. So these are the functions which have upper, finite upper Riemannian sums. And if we take the, the continuous elements in this space, these are really functions which have a Riemann integral in a non-usual way. You write this infinite sum and you don't have to take limits and everything is fine. Uh, this space is uh, having a dual space, which we may also discuss a bit later on. And this dual space is called the space of translation bounded <coughs> measures. So I was mentioning that the Wiener algebra is local C0 global L1, and that duality can be played coordinate wise. So if I tell you locally it's like C0 continuous functions, let's say, on the interval, then we know the dual space, we have used this terminology, are the bounded measures. Locally, it's bounded measures. If you are having local, a global L1, the, the dual condition is L infinity. So I use this symbol for the dual of the winner space, and uh, I, I find this space quite, quite useful because all the LP spaces are already in this space. 
and uh, homogeneous Banach spaces, I mean, in the terminology of Katz-Nelson, they are all in the L1 part of this space. So locally, absolutely continuous measures. But if you take the L1 norm, it's not that they, the L1 norms have to be absolutely summable, like a bounded measure, but they're just each interval has finite L1 norm, and the L1 norms over the pieces are uniformly bounded. That, that's really what you need. Uh, I would like to mention that Professor Gil de la Madrid, maybe 20 or so, maybe even more years ago, has established a theory of uh, measures, potentially unbounded measures, which have a Fourier transform which is also unbounded. And he was defining this in a not so easy way. And uh, then you had the same problem that you have with L1. You'd say integral transform is okay. They, he has another trick to go to the between function measure and transformable it's transform. But in the way how it was setting up, it was not possible to go back. So that, oh, what are the uh, transformable measure which have a transform, which is always a Radon transform in his case, but where this Radon transform can also be put back to the case. And I was looking at his, his problem in my terminology using this space of translation bounded measures. And it turned out, and that's something I could even plot here, I could say, take the intersection of this object with its rotated version by 90 degree. So if you have a measure, which is potentially an unbounded measure, but its Fourier transform is a, bound, is, is a, is a measure, uh, and then you take something that where, where this property is OK on both sides, then you have a transformable measure. So for example, you take constant one, that's the Lebesgue measure. That's clearly a nice object, and it has a Fourier transform. That's even a bounded measure, so there's absolutely no problem. What we will also see, and that's Poisson's formula, I mentioned it right away, that the Dirac comb sitting on the integer lattice can be viewed as an object in, that, uh, in this blue space. It has a Fourier transform, which is this object itself. So clearly it's uh, transformable measures. So kind of, I think this is what he had in mind. You can have um, discrete measures which are uh, translation bounded and have Fourier transform which are translation bounded. And uh, uh, only relatively recently have, uh, we had a paper in, in the journal of Fourier analysis where you can, uh, where uh, an author, uh, Kulantzakis, was showing that you can produce other examples which do not have any periodicity where you still have something kind of a discrete measure where the Fourier transform is another discrete measure which is not coming from Poisson. I mean, it's very easy. You can take Poisson formula for one lattice and then take another lattice and you add up two such things. That's kind of harmless. Uh, but in many cases, you can show that's the only choice that you can have measures on both sides. There was actually uh, also a paper of Cordoba uh, that I remember that more or less the, if you don't allow different amplitudes, uh, but if you have a discrete measure, just the sum of Dirac's, such that the Fourier transform is well defined in the distributional sense, and it's also a sum of Dirac's, then it can be only through Poisson's formula. Then it has to be a lattice, and the orthogonal lattice is where you have the, the center. So this is just to, to remind you about the function spaces, and we have the amalgam spaces and, and all these things. Um, another thing that I thought I should rather quickly put on the slide, um, is uh, the continuous embedding of a zero into L2. So the justification why is my circle I inside the L2 circle. Uh, the one argument that I was giving in uh, more or less in, in detail, but uh, more or less only in words, was because of the interpretation of the reconstruction formula. Uh, the definition that I use now was a zero is the space of all L2 functions which have a integrable short time Fourier transform. So you have something integrable, or you can say it's a bounded measure on the Fourier transform side. And then I was telling you, whenever you have a bounded measure and a way to come from the underlying space, so from phase space to the, oper to the unitary operators, and it's compatible with the composition, composition law, so we have this projective representation, the composition of two time frequency shifts is more or less a time frequency shift operator. It's a time frequency shift operator with a phase factor, but that is not so bad. Then you can, of course, explain what the discrete measure is doing. So I'm taking my short time Fourier transform and make a fine lattice to get the Riemannian sum. This fine lattice will give me some expression in any time frequency invariant function space. So in any LP space, especially in L1, it has to be convergent. And in the limit, the thing will not explode. So I will get in the limit something that I can control. So the a zero norm by this reason will be 
But we have a much easier argument if you remember uh, the basic properties that we have uh, mentioned for this, uh, for the short-term Fourier transform. I hope I find it here. Yeah, we had two key properties. One is Cauchy-Schwarz is giving you the size of the spectrogram is not bigger uh, than the norm of the L2 function, especially if we normalize this window, which is always a good recommend normalization. Uh, the second thing is, uh, again, I remember that this is called Moyal's formula, and you can find it in the book of Charlie Gröchenig and in the book of Folland on harmonic analysis of phase space or so. It's isometric, so it's a kind of iterative, uh, w I mean, you, you rep I think twice you apply Plancherel theorem, so it comes in the easy, natural way out of Plancherel. Again, it's one, so you have an embedding. And this was, as I said, this isometric embedding property was the reason why you could say that inverse mapping is the joint mapping. And I just t remind you, taking the transform is analysis. You're taking scalar products with your continuous family. A joint is synthesis, like matrix multiplication with A prime and A. And uh, so th th maybe remember these two properties. I will rename for simplicity this capital F, and if we need VGG, it might be called capital G. So it's like people saying, I'm going from the function domain to the transform domain. So uh, in full transform analysis, often people say little f is going to capital F, or our engineers would say uh, x of t is going to capital X of omega or so. But it's just so that you know what is. So the transform is going into this space. Now, uh, going back to this one page slide. Uh, the uniform estimate is this, and this is Moyal saying that we can estimate in this particular situation the maximum of a function by the L2 norm of the function. But by definition, if we are in the S0 space, our transform is also integrable. So how can we estimate now the L2 norm by the L1 norm? And uh, uh, so going even to the signal domain, I would say, well, we would like to estimate the square of the function for convenience, but by Moyal, this is the same as the square norm of its transform. But if somebody asks you, can you estimate the square, and it tells you the function is integrable and bounded, you write out the integral f square. f squared is one guy is pulled out with a maximum, that's the infimum, the supernorm norm, and what is remaining is the simple integral, that's f1 norm. The f1 norm I rewrite as zero norm, and the l2 norm is because of this equation is this. So this is really a kind of three-line proof, or if I, if I uh, say, because now you have to divide by, by the L2 norm, and you get the L2 norm is at most, and the remaining factor is this here. So it's really, if the normalization of the window is chosen, uh, you have uh, not just some constant embedding for abstract reasons or so, but you have really this, this explicit constant. OK, uh, now uh, I was telling you. Yeah, here, here you have, again, the definition. The zero norm is uh, uh, by the integral of the transform, which I called capital F, and it was the L1 norm that I was using to describe the zero norm. Now, uh, I was mentioning maybe two properties. The isometric time frequency shift invariance combined with the minimality, which in turn gave the, the, the property that it's Fourier invariance. Uh, but there is also another way, uh, which I don't give now, but I can describe roughly the idea. I told you that the space can also be described as the amalgam space local Fourier algebra global L1. So essentially the proof would be in the following. We only have to prove that an individual atom is okay, because when you can do a uniform estimate on the Fourier transform side, you would uh, add up all these estimates. So if somebody tells you I have a function in the Fourier algebra living in the interval from 5 to 6 or so, then I will say, OK, I can, just in words now, I can reproduce it by multiplying pointwise with the plateau function. And then it goes down. So maybe a trapezoidal function would be good enough. What does it mean that f, or f number 5, is mul multiplied with the plateau function? I go to the Fourier transform side. Locally, it was in the Fourier algebra. So f5, going on the other side, and now I'm on the Fourier domain or so, is an L1 function. But it's reproduced by some other nice guy who is, maybe I take a smooth plateau function. 
that smooth plateau function reproduces by convolution. I can choose it actually because I know all this space or, or because it's easy by something in the Siegel algebra, in the F Siegel algebra named WFL1L1. So you tell me you can control the L1 norm, but I reproduce it with something. I have a norm estimate because of Siegel algebra, so actually I can control the Siegel algebra norm. I can do this for piece number five. If I go now back to piece number four, can I use the same plateau function? Well, you have to say, well, it was at that position. I have to shift it. But again, the usual tricks, shifting on the time side means modulation on this side. So somebody, I have to ask, well, now I have to take that inverse Fourier transform and I have to modulate it. I mean, the Siegel algebra is zero, but it's the smallest modulation space invariant space. So I don't change the norm if I modulate whatever is uh, according. So I'm having the same constant for the estimate. I'm adding up all the pieces. That's kind of how I was proving this with the definition of this um, discrete decomposition W FL1 L1. And maybe uh, because I might not have time to go back to this, I would like to remind you, I mean, how is this definition related to the amalgam definition? Uh, and I was already explaining in the last, like yesterday, that we have two ways of understanding the amalgam spaces. The one, I would say, the easy one, uh, building the highway by doing concrete things. I mean, uh, square, uh, rectangles, uh, con another concrete, another concrete, so partition of unity was my story. Or we can write, uh, do the highway by asphalt. <coughs> we do it in a continuous way. <laughs> and whether the continuous integral of all these local uh, FL1 norms is finite, which is another way of rewriting this. That's the only thing I have to mention. I don't want to do the details now. So this is just an elegant way of writing the amalgam norm with local FL1 norm uh, in, a, in another way. So somehow this short-term Fourier transform built in is having some Fourier transform component, which means if you integrate over the omega direction, you're actually taking Fourier algebra norm of the local piece, and then you collect all these Fourier algebra norms continuously over the whole domain. So that took me a while to go from the discrete Wiener amalgam description which where I was starting these properties to the continuous one and then realizing there's a connection to the spectrogram that I had learned by my visit to the people doing MP3 and then talking uh, to people or having actually a summer school with uh, Professor Weiss, uh, Roger Howe and, and Tedlev Boguntke, we realized, oh, this is the Heisenberg group. So these time frequency shift operators that used, engineers used is also uh, occurring in the representation theory of the reduced Heisenberg group or in the ordinary Heisenberg group where you factor out the center if you like a representation theory. So there are a lot of connections to, to other subjects. Now, uh, I will just mention one thing uh, which we had already at the end of last session. It's not only the Fourier invariance, but also these regularization properties. You can take arbitrary elements in the dual space. We will discuss them extra separately and can smooth them and approximate them in the weak star sense so uh, by, by test functions. So if you give me a sigma in this space, again, we could say it could be a Dirac comb, a sum of Dirac measures sitting at the unit lattice. That would be a very good example of something which is in, in the space a zero prime. It's, of course, also a tempered distribution, but it's far much more concrete. A tempered distribution could say, value here, derivative here, second derivative there, as long as you keep the order uh, bounded that would be and, 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 may, and maybe the, the amplitude's not uh, growing, that would be okay. N times delta N uh, would be okay. In my case, I am not taking derivatives, it's just deltas that happen. And, uh, but still, a delta is rough locally, it's not, not smooth, and it's not decaying. So what would these operations do? And you can imagine that I will take approximate units for the corresponding operation. So the Gauss function or all Schwarz functions are inside S0. So if I say I do this, I do first convolution, then multiplication. So what would you do? You would take this Dirac comp, convolve it with a very tiny Gauss function. So you have an infinite stream of Gauss functions sitting at the integer lattice. It's already a very smooth bounded function, but it's not decaying. So what you do, you localize it. So you multiply it with a very broad, very slowly decaying function. So I would say 
ST row of Gauss function for S convolution approximate identity um, and a D row Gauss function dilation is an approximate unit. Why is this convergent in the weak star sense? Well, you just say, well, if I apply this to the other side, then I only have to know, which is quite easy, that if you apply on, on a zero elements a, a Dirac kernel, it's okay. If you multiply it, you say, I go to the free transform side, but it's invariant, and that's again a Dirac kernel. So it's twice Dirac kernel, then no problem. If you change the order, you would say, first I have my deltas with amplitude one. I damp the amplitudes first, and then I convolve, which I think is for me a little bit better because then you would really have one prototype of a Gauss function and you just change the amplitude. But I mean, otherwise you would say there's a m tiny effect that you have a narrow Gauss function but still not uh, living on a point set and you multiply with a, with, a, with a Gauss function, a flat Gauss function, but which is not exactly. So the individual atoms look slightly different in, in the first procedure, whereas here you would have really a sum of shifted Gauss functions. So essentially that would tell you a Dirac measure can be in the weak star be approximated, of course, by a finite sum of, 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 of dilated Gauss functions. You just put all of them which have amplitude which are up to some size and the ones which are so tiny that you don't need them, you leave them out. And then you take more and more and further out and closer to one and that, that's actually what you can do. Okay, so that was a hand-waving argument uh, for this. Uh, Maybe uh, I also go on with, with this slide here from, from the talk in Novisat is about the Poisson formula. So the Poisson formula sometimes is explained as one of the key properties of the Fourier transform. Uh, so if you see it in the form that you have here, it looks a little bit magic. I mean, you have a very complicated transform in, in some sense, like the Fourier transform. And then somebody says, if I take the sum of the samples of this function, uh, the sum of the integer lattice, fk, I'm getting exactly the sum of the Fourier transform side. So how can you explain it? And the usual way of explaining it is the following. Uh, it's, it's not so difficult to understand at least why it's plausible. The first thing is that I'm saying, well, we have a function, think of an ordinary function, and we periodize it. So we would like to use theory of Fourier transform for classic in the classical theory. So you're saying the bump function is having some decay, I periodize it. In our case, we know it's something that is in the Wiener algebra. So if you pile up something where the upper Riemann and sums are controlled, it's very easy to see that th this will be absolutely convergent. I mean, I'm taking the, the shifted version by one and two and three from left and from right, and by definition, there is the, the sum of the upper bars is accumulating, so it's like a Weierstrass test. This will be nicely uniformly convergent. In the abstract, or the theory, in measure theory, you would say, I'm starting with an L1 function. And little, I mean, capital L1 is amalgam space little L1 with little L, with uh, local L1 with global L1, of course. So the total integral over the real line is the sum, the absolutely convergent sum of the integrals of the pieces. So you can say sigma additivity of the pieces or so. And of course then again you can add them up and it will be convergent in the L1 sense. Now there you have to be careful if something is convergent in L1, or well it's absolutely convergent in L1, then it will be convergent almost everywhere. So slight difference, whereas in the L1 case you have convergence almost everywhere only, you have uniform convergence in our setting. I'm uh, claiming only for a zero, and a zero is, um, is inside the mean algebra, so uniform convergence. So somehow it's, I think I have, can have been able to convince you by this uh, argument using words only, that fk summed up is just the value of the periodic function at zero. So you've periodized in all the values. You could also What's sometimes done, you could write f of k plus x and x is in the unit wall, interval, then you would look this, this periodized function at all the x. And then it's also quite reasonable, then you can say this is a function defined almost everywhere and we're making statements almost everywhere. But I think we really would like to have this sum should be convergent, this sum should be convergent. 
And uh, now I'm making a statement which is kind of stupid, but uh, it will help you to memorize it. Poisson's formula is not always true. So this is may turn out to be crucial because it means you can have situations where the left-hand side is convergent maybe to zero and the right-hand con is convergent maybe to one. Both absolutely convergent, they are not equal. So let's see what the explanation is why uh, the right-hand side should be okay in our case and, and why the argument fails in general and people have found counterexamples. So uh, the first thing is we have to think what happens if you periodize a function by looking at the Fourier transform. Now in the MATLAB session we have already seen that sampling a function means periodizing the spectrogram. And if I use the, the opposite direction, I would say then probably periodizing means sampling. Uh, another way of thinking about this, again in words and not, not mathematically, is if somebody has a function which contains all the frequencies, because we have a continuous Fourier transform describing the function as a superposition of all the frequencies, but somehow we make it periodic, after having a periodic function, we should need not need all the, peri all the frequencies which are not periodic. So only the ones which are fitting my periodicity should survive, which are the functions of the form chi s, e to the 2 pi i s t, which are integer periodic. These are exactly the integers. So the truth is you have to compute the Fourier coefficients, that's f n, and there the point is that's, that's the analysis behind it. These values are on the one hand, the values of the continuous Fourier transform of our function, and on the other side, they are the Fourier coefficients of the periodized function. This is what you have to prove. But it's also not very difficult, because what is the Fourier coefficient, let's say, of the periodized function? You have a pile of functions which comes from all the pieces, and you have an exponential function. But the exponential function, well, you do it here because it's convenient to, in to integrate over the unit interval. But if you would say, well, part number three, minus three maybe, is coming from here. So you have to say, I could all spread it out. Then I would have another function. But a periodic function with the right period has the same values here, either here on the piece spread out or piled up here. So you just write the integral of the Fourier transform. So what I'm using here, the value of the Fourier transform is an integral. You split the integral into pieces, rewrite it as the, sum, the corresponding sum and using the exponential law and so it's fine. So the exponential property and the, one can say, the orthogonal lattice, the set of all frequencies S in the frequency domain which have the property that on this lattice they are one. This is exactly the integer lattice, that's why the, this comes in twice. And that's one of the reasons why I like the 2 pi in the exponent much better than the 2 pi in the reconstruction formula. But I think that's already m mostly agreed Fortunately, even between engineers and mathematicians, there are still people doing it in other way for other traditions, for other normalizations, but I think that's good. So we have this. So the, the question is, is this absolutely convergent? Knowing that I r can reinterpret it as Fourier coefficients of the periodized function or as sampling values of the continuous Fourier transform. Uh, then I would say we have seen that for f in S0, that f hat will be also in S0. So the f hat is a function with upper finite upper Riemann and sums. So I'm sampling at the, at the lattice point. Each lattice point is, of course, sitting in its interval and so contributing to the maximum. So the maximum, the sum of the maxima is finite. Therefore, the sum of the individual values must be finite. So it's clear that we are in the situation. This is absolutely convergent. This is the value of the periodized Fourier transform. So y is uh, the identity here. And that's very easy because I can say, if you give me the Fourier coefficients and you tell me you have a continuous function where the Fourier coefficients are absolutely convergent, I write it as Fourier expansion. So the explanation of Poisson's formula is right here, e to the 2 pi i n coefficient number zero. Evaluate the frequencies at zero. And then you don't see them, they're not here. So it's really the, uh, a zero situation says, you can periodize, it's a stable process. You can sample, it's a stable process going into L1. You have Fourier expansion of an absolutely convergent Fourier series, so uh, Venus algebra, now there's another Venus algebra of absolutely Fourier series, says at every point you have this. Now, 
If you have a function in the zero, just to mention this right away, it's of course also the same argument in RD. Then you can have a lattice here. Here you have an orthogonal lattice. For example, you can stretch the function, then you sample not at, a, uh, at the lattice, but maybe at a more and more refined lattice. If this is a fine lattice, this will be a coarse lattice. If it's multidimensional, maybe, I don't know, hexagonal lattice, it's introduced from the standard lattice by applying a matrix. And then the lattice on the other side is the, mat uh, the, the lattice coming from the transpose conjugate of that matrix. So you can imagine uh, this is the most beautiful situation because it's most balanced, but you can also have other situations where you have dense sampling on one side and, and co very coarse sampling on the other side. And it's really a very, very strong, a very powerful theorem. And yeah, and maybe I should mention in Katz Nelson's book, you can find this such a counterexample. So a function where the strange thing happened that the convergence which takes place almost everywhere is made to fail at zero in a way that even the sum is convergent. So you don't verify there's trouble uh, going on, but it's, uh, it's, it's arti I mean artificially, it's on purpose made such that this. You will not have this very often, and very often you have conditions that under certain conditions, so I could say, if you are in the so-called Sobolev space of order two, which in, uh, from L1, then nothing happens. So if somebody tells you, I have written this and f has a derivative, maybe in the distributional sense, of order one and order two, then I'm sure it's, 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 it's okay. I personally am sure because I know that this is a sufficient condition for, for being in a zero. <laughs> so uh, if somebody says he has two derivatives in L1, more or less you say, well, I take a local piece, I can even take Fourier coefficients of, of order two. So it's Riemann-Lebesgue after multiplying with k squared, so the Fourier coefficients of each of the pieces must decay in a summable way, and therefore you can have this sober. So, I mean, all the all the things that I know uh, are uh, conditions which are actually sufficient conditions for being in a zero. And Kahan and Katznelson had a paper, I think, in '93, showing that you can have even mild decay conditions on the time set on the Fourier transform side. So. LP condition with polynomial growth, uh, weights with polynomial growth. And, and if the conditions are kind of too soft, you have counterexamples. And Charlie Grochenig was checking these papers and he was showing if and only if they can produce counterexamples, these intersections are not contained in a zero. And when they don't have counterexamples, it's because, from our perspective, we're inside a zero. So Yes, this, we had this example yesterday. If you are in a Sobolev in a, a Shubin class, so you have the balanced smoothness L2 uh, condition with weight larger than D and, uh, and uh, Sobolev space of L2 type in this case. If this, both parameters are larger than D, then you're inside a zero. And if I remember correctly, if this condition fails to be true, then they can still have make counterexamples. So it's, it's a very natural indication that uh, most of the time, this is a good, uh, very general condition. Now I have to check. Uh, I think I would like to go to the slides uh, that I have continued. So our standard course was, uh, although the slides I tried to go through are these ones, and we are somewhere. We have seen all this. Yeah, so the last thing that we were discussing was this picture that we say this is my symbol for bounded measures and the discrete and the L1 are kind of dense but only in the weak star topology they are disjoint. That's why I didn't write. But now I want to really completely change the topic and come uh, to the discussion of how should we look at frames, how should we look at re-spaces uh, and uh, I remember really a discussion very long ago when first the, the first papers came out, and I think it was related to Garber analysis, and where people were saying, well, you had frames, and this was Hilbert space theory. Well, instead of orthogonal bases, you have even more general systems that are not orthogonal with some redundancy. And then there are even things like tight frames, and tight frames are behaving like orthonormal bases, 
and uh, and but they are they are not autonomous bases because they are having some linear dependencies. And some comment was maybe this is because of the infinite dimensionality of the Hilbert space or so. Until we realized that everything is much better understood if you go to linear algebra, understand it here, and then you generalize back from the finite dimensional case. So if I want to show you a tight frame of redundancy 3 over 2, then I try to make an orthonormal system. And you look at it and you say, I see something flat. So if I would draw a Mercedes star, that's an example, I think, introduced by Ingrid Obshi in her book. You take uh, these three vectors at 120 degree, and uh, you would like to check that this is an, uh, a tight frame. And the verification can be done or so, but this picture of a three-dimensional autonomous system projected on a plane is really better. And of course, you can even do the, it in a different angle, but in this direction, you will see they have equal lengths. So finite dimensional spaces to have vectors of equal lengths which have the property that they behave like an orthonormal system. So every vector is expanded as a linear combination of the coefficients that you get by taking this color product of the vector with these three vectors. And if you look at this, it's, it's very easy. I mean, I take any vector in a plane spanned by this on the blackboard, so to say. Well, uh, then you can say, well, put a zero component in that direction then in that orthogonal system they have a, have, a, have a representation because the three vectors are an orthogonal system in a larger space. But then you're asked what are the coefficients of vectors in three space with respect to s for, for a vector which is in the plane and you say well I can project everything. I mean project a, vec a, a vector in a, pla in a subspace with a vector general is this in the subspace you have the projection and the projection is projection squared, which is self adjoint You put it over and you can project everything which is out of the plane and it, it doesn't play a role. So something which is very nice, of course you are losing orthogonality, we are losing redundancy, but it's having this, this nice property. And there is a nice principle which is kind of non-trivial but rather, rather helpful for understanding is that tight frames are exactly the orthogonal projections of systems in larger Hilbert spaces. So if somebody is giving you, in, in that case, if I would put them in the right position, I always say, I could maybe have a frame which is even tight because I have computed something of redundancy 5 over 3. So you would say, well, that means he's writing these five vectors, three-dimensional vectors, in a 3 by 5 matrix. And I'm saying, more or less, you can add a, a component number 4 and 5 so that the continued square matrix is really just a unitary matrix. So clearly, if you take away from a unitary matrix some information, in those components that you are looking at, it has good properties. So that's kind of how you can imagine <laughs> how Gabor frames, uh, how, how um, tight frames are. So verifying that um, the general <coughs> problem uh, of non-orthogonal expansions or unique uh, basis for subspaces, which are uh, proper terminology nowadays, Ries basic sequences, um, is something that one should be able to understand in a finite dimensional setting, in a finite dimensional way. And now I'm using these four spaces that we have done in the, in the, in the, in the uh, MATLAB course uh, related to the singular value decomposition. I will try to do that in, in three minutes with my standard show, so to say. The standard show says, you're giving me a matrix, and I'm thinking of my test matrix with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, which is rank 2, so the range, the column space is a plane. And the null space is a one-dimensional space. But the orthogonal complement of the null space turns out to be the row space. So I have the row space and I have the, uh, the orthogonal complement, one-dimensional. No, it's not the row space, it's the column space of A prime. You think of A transpose, A transpose conjugate for complex. So we have uh, this here. We also have a range space, which in that case is not everything. So it has an orthogonal complement. But by symmetry, you can guess that this will be the null space of A prime. So I have in my hands the idea, an operator, matrix multiplication, is moving from R, Rn to Rm. It has a null space, a target space, and the transpose matrix, transpose conjugate, is going in the operator, it has a null space in this. 
And now one of the claims that you can easily get out of singular value decomposition is we can fabricate a lot of other mappings which have always the same null spaces and the same target spaces. So if you are interested in what is the gram matrix or what is the frame matrix or what is the pseudo inverse or what is the composition of the of the pseudo inverse with the matrix or so, then you would say, let's say, what is the pseudo inverse? Where is it going? It's putting a right hand side, I mean, you are saying AX equal B. Now I'm give, you give me the B and I apply pseudo inverse to find the minimal normal least square solution. So somehow it goes back from here. What is the null space of the pseudo inverse? It's the blue guy. What is the range space? It's the row space. If you combine the pseudo inverse with the matrix, even without using symbols, just using the geometric picture, you can say, okay, I mean, somehow I, I remember it was a projection, but I don't remember where it was. Wh where is it going? I mean, operator-wise. It starts here, it goes over here, and then I go back. And I'm telling you the null space of this combined mapping must be the blue guy that must map everything to zero, which is in the blue guy. The range space, the ra full or exact range space, is this here. So if it's a projection operator, with that null space and that range space, it will be the projection. We have verified it in MATLAB. If you switch the role, you say, first I apply the matrix, then I apply the pseudo inverse, I have the projection on the row space. If somebody give you a linear dependent collection of column vectors, you will have a stable projection on this, use the in pseudo inverse, don't use Gram-Schmidt, because you, you have much better stability or so. So th this, these are stories. Now, in, in the diagram, <coughs> what I'm doing geometrically is I find much more clear compared to writing or everything with sums or coordinates or even, I mean, writing with, with the operators is a good thing. Uh, looking at this at the diagram is, I think, even better. So this is my, from my point of view, the, my right hand, which is the column space of A prime, and this is this. So we all know row space equal column space because we can use Gauss elimination to find the number of pivot elements, this tells me both the number of basis elements in the row space or column space. But my explanation is, you see these five fingers, they map nicely one into each other. So if you have your linear mapping describing the mapping from here to here, if I have this mapping, it has a null space. If I throw away the null space, I have not thrown away anything from the image. So restricting the mapping, the matrix multiplication, to the vectors in the row space. And now it's really important if you do MATLAB that this is a collection of column vectors of the appropriate length. If I have this, it has no null space. Therefore, this mapping must be an isomorphism. So in short, uh, with this picture in mind, and you get this diagram and you can say, all the possible linear mappings that we have are actually, uh, we have three dimensions. The rank of the matrix, the dimension of the domain, and the dimension of the target space. So if I want to have a random matrix, uh, I would say choose an R-dimensional subspace, choose another R-dimensional subspace, establish any isomorphism between these two guys, and then put the rest to zero. So if you have the orthogonal complement of this space, everything is put to zero and put this to zero. What is the best way of inverting this isomorphism? Of course, you go from here to here. And if you have lost information, then you cannot recover it. So the pseudo is inverse in this picture is really inverting the part which is invertible and forgetting the rest. And, and so then you can ask, well, when do you have in this situation uh, not a full diagram? Clearly you don't have an orthogonal complement to the column space if this is everything, because then I have a surjective mapping. So you should say, well, a system of vectors if you use them to synthesize, and if it's a Bessel system in the terminology of modern uh, frame theory, then you should assume that the range space is closed. And if that's everything, then you have exactly this picture with, uh, with maybe surjectivity means there's nothing here. Injectivity means, of course, that you have the opposite direction. Or actually, surjectivity tells you that there's nothing here, and then you have injectivity of T prime. So that's another story. Uh, uh, matrix uh, that we can, that are really interesting. So one is a matrix in this most general situation, a rectangular matrix. 
if it has both a null space and a defect on the range space. If it's kind of a little bit nice, then uh, it's a rectangular matrix, because invertible matrices are easy in that case. But it's rectangular, uh, and it will have maximal rank. So if you give me two vectors in R3, they should be linear independent. I mean, I cannot show you five vectors in R12, because we are not having imagination of that kind of geometry. If I give you five vectors in R3, they should not be <coughs> bad enough to generate only a plane. They should be in general position. And then they are allowing you to generate everything, but then you would like, you are interested in the minimal norm representation, and which is again explained by this picture. So uh, I will uh, just mention that in the slides you can read what I have told you in the, in the story. And uh, I have just last night or this morning even probably, I was adding this comment. It's really a kind of warning. Uh, we learn in linear algebra course what, I mean, we learn vector spaces and we learn about uh, uh, linear combinations as the first thing that you can do. So a vector space is something where you can do linear combinations. And then you ask, is the whatever you can represent uniquely represented? Is whatever you uh, can, uh, can you represent everything? And the ideal thing is a coordinate system where every vector has a unique representation. That's about invertible matrix. This is emphasized. It's very important, of course, yes. But as we've seen, minimal normally square allows you to deal with the more general situation or so. Now we go to the Hilbert space. We have a scalar product with vectors. We are doing representation. Now in the Hilbert <coughs> space, we are emphasizing that we need the norm to express what an infinite sum is, because we are not stuck with finite. I mean, basis in the in the log logic sense, so a Hummel basis where every element can be represented in a unique way as a finite sum is something which exists according to Zorn's lemma or so, but it's not good to work with. So it's kind of, it has to be so huge. Uh, and, and so it's really much better to say, well, have a basis. So when you have Banach spaces, it's reasonable to think about basis. Now, why don't we use in functional analysis basis? First argument, because you might not find a good basis or writing linear operators by infinite matrices may be cumbersome. They realized you don't have to write down the matrix, manipulate all the coordinates. You can define the joint in a much more elegant way, so it's, it's a convenience matter or so. But then Professor Mr. Enflow was coming, I think 72 or so, and was showing us there are even nasty Banach spaces which you normally don't meet or so, but which do not have a basis. What does it mean? If you take a reasonable notion of a basis in the Banach space allowing infinite sums, and actually there are many f fine variants of this concept, then either it's too small and you can represent every vector, or if you have enough vectors in that nasty space, then it will be um, uh, you're losing the uniqueness. So if not every Banach space has a basis, it's not good to work with basis. And the modern thing, in I would say, in differential geometry I learned, you try to express things in a coordinate-free way. So without choosing a basis, doing things in the basis, and then discussing why it does not depend on the particular basis. It's usually a very cumbersome thing. It helps you to get an idea because you do concrete computations. But if you don't know if the space has a basis, if you know there are spaces without a basis, it's certainly good to avoid this. So what is the analogy of linear, of linear independence? And it's kind of, I would say nowadays, looking back, it's a convenient trick to avoid these problems with infinite sums, but it's kind of avoiding something and, and not giving a right concept. It's, it's linear independent if every linear, every finite linear combination, which is zero, has to necessarily have, have uh, uh, zero, zero coefficients. Now, especially Gaber analysis is a gu good guiding line where we are discussing coarse lattices in time frequency plane are may be good because they are independent but they don't represent everything, make them finer or finer. You can make arbitrary fine, as even if the lattice constant is, I don't know, 1 over 10, redundancy 100 somehow, finitely many or, uh, Gauss functions, shifted Gauss functions or time frequency shift Gauss functions, they are all linear independent. And I can give you a, a nice argument I learned from a, from a student of mine who unfortunately has passed away. Um, he was uh, trying to give a proof in, in, in the 
translation case, and that's really the imp most important case. So in, as you assume, you have 20 shifted Gauss functions which are put up with random coefficients or so, and the sum is zero. So maybe the amplitudes are canceling out so that it's very same. Then his argument was, then I go very far away. So I'm looking at this sum here. Then you have to look at the Gauss functions. There's one guy in this family of finitely many Gauss functions who has this center nearest to myself. And if you go very far, this decay of the Gauss function is so strong that this non-zero coefficient of, of, let's say, number one is so much bigger that all the others are never compensating. I mean, I, I, if you tell me you have a linear combination, I can tell you, well, the 19 of them have to have a certain total sum of the maxima. But they are a little bit further away, and therefore they cannot compensate here anymore. So number one wasn't here. So the 19 have to do the zero themselves, and you repeat the argument. So it's very easy because you have finitely many. I would say, well, at this place, at a distance minus uh, plus minus 3, a Gauss function for me is zero. I mean, it's, it's less than the precision of MATLAB. So I cannot check this condition because I'm adding 10 to the minus 50 to 10 to the minus 20 or so. That's all numerically zero. So for practical reasons, I think it's not a very convincing argument. So practically, you may have nicely convergent, absolutely convergent sums, and that, that should be distinguished. So uh, I would say, uh, and that's really what, what now, nowadays the right concept is, if you have infinite families or so, and they are made such that this summation of the, of the coefficients with the two coefficients is okay. It's called the Bessel family. It's a one version of writing Bessel condition. And if in thi this situation the sum is zero and you can conclude that then the, the coefficients have to be zero, that's maybe the right thing. Now, uh, going back to our picture, I'm just more or less telling you, well, let's try to figure out what happens if there are two Hilbert spaces. When can you do in the same thing? You have a Hilbert space. T is a mapping from one Hilbert space to another. What is this here? That's the null space of the bounded linear mapping from one Hilbert space to another one, maybe from a bounded linear Hilbert space to the L2 space. I'm taking scalar products of, of my family of vectors, countable family, and I have assumed that these are okay. That will be a closed subspace. So the problem is, the range space, the closed linear span of all the coefficients that I get, they might not be a closed subspace. And then it's a difference whether I take the closure of this or I take the, the space itself. And that's why these frame conditions and the respaces conditions come in. That you would say these diagrams are valid if you have mappings where everything is closed because then you have a splitting of the range space with the orthogonal complement, and then more or less all the things go back. A mapping from one Hilbert space to another one has a pseudo-inverse, and you would say, well, I'm getting Ax equal B, maybe you write Tx equals B, and you're saying, but my B is not in the, is in the Hilbert space, but not in the range of the operator. But I told you the range is supposed to be or, uh, closed, then you do the <coughs> orthogonal projection, now I'm in the range, there is something in, in the thing, how do the difference of, of different solutions depend? It's just a null space plus something in the, in the orthogonal complement of the null space. You choose the element in what we call the row space, and you're just repeating the, the, the Euclidean situation. So in that sense, this is really what you have to do. Now, uh, yeah, so maybe uh, I mentioned the other, so I'm, I was explaining in big detail now the, the problem with uh, linear independence you should have a different version of linear independence. And that will be the concept <laughs> of, of respaces. And the other one is the concept of a frame, which corresponds to generating system. And uh, again, you think, well, generating system mean, means the vectors span everything. Now we are in a, in, a, in a Hilbert space. So maybe it's not a good idea to stick with finite, with finite linear combinations. So one is having an operator having dense, uh, a, a, a full range or so. Well, you might say, well, it has full range if uh, every vector is represented. That would be better. But because of the natural, you say, well, if the set is total, if the linear combinations are dense. And again, I can use in words the situation 
of the Gaber system. So Gaber was thinking that if you take the Gauss functions shifted along the integer lattice and modulated again <coughs> along the int integer lattice, you get you get um, a, 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 a coordinate system. So you get the re spaces. I mean, obviously he knew that the shifted Gauss function uh, and another shifted Gauss function are not orthogonal are not orthogonal to each other, or so there is some overlap. But we all know, I mean, if I hold my fingers like this, is well, it's not an orthogonal basis, but it's a not too far away from an <coughs> orthogonal basis, so it would be still considered a very good basis. Okay, but uh, uh, the system that he was suggesting actually is a total family. So maybe I don't know if I have put this into this slide now. I have it somewhere else, in, I think, in the other notes, in the talk. But I can tell you this story. So it's a total system. So you would say, okay, you can represent almost every vector. In some engineering book I even read, because it's a total subset, you can represent. And that's because people were thinking it's like linear algebra. If you can approximate arbitrary well, of course, then you can write the element as an infinite series. Well, uh, there is a very big difference between representation as an infinite series, which is convergent, and approximation. And I usually use the following drastic word. Somebody tells me, I can produce software for you. And you can ask the specifications, whatever you want, I will do for you. And then I say, okay, please, I would like to have, I don't know, a database having these and these properties. And then he's delivering, I'm uh, paying, and after a while he, I'm saying, oh, I would need something better. He says, oh, I can do it. Throw away the old thing, and I make a new one, and you pay once more, and you have a somewhat better with one extra feature. We would think it should be upwards compatible. That's what you really expect if you promise I can do everything for you, he, or if he's designing it well, he would say, I have a partial sum, and you need more precision. I take more terms, so you're paying, of course, for this extra feature, but you're not r destroying everything. <coughs> and the other thing is uh, why it doesn't work with this idea of uh, approximation. You have an approximation that has a certain price, meaning the coefficients are having a certain quality. Then you're asking for better approximation, then the price will increase. Well, that means the norm will be bigger. But what does it mean for an individual coefficient? So I'm saying, well, okay, I'm willing to play the game. You're giving an approximation of quality epsilon and then epsilon half, epsilon quarter. I'm just saying, well, I'm mostly interested in coefficient number 18. And you're saying me, for that approximation, you need this coefficient. The next one, you need this coefficient. The next one, up and down. So it's just oscillating. There is no limit for any of these coordinates because the more I'm trying to have it better, the improvement will be minor and the coefficients will oscillate more and more. And these shifted Gauss functions are a good example where we, we can see that you can take shifted Gauss functions, they're always linear independent, they're even a re spaces for the linear span. If, you are, if they're separate, they're very nice. But the, if you make it more and more dense, if you look at the theory of splant up spaces, you can see why it's like this, I don't go into this then you will see that there is very little improvement and uh, you can have um, uh, coefficients which are oscillating more and more. Another example <coughs> that I will explain later is uh, you can take uh, Gauss functions and, and the example I, at that time I was doing was you can take s a hexagonal pattern in the time frequency plane with a midpoint. So you have seven Gauss functions and you can do this with a fixed radius. And then you make this uh, big radius and small radius or so. And it's just for people who are familiar with Hermit functions, I, I mentioned the following story. If you make the radius big, you have s seven isolated Gauss functions. They are orthogonal to each other. They are spanning a seven-dimensional space. If you make them more and more narrow, suddenly the span does not really depend anymore on the, on the, on the, on the position. So from a given radius on, they're all very more or less the same because there is only one most concentrated uh, space and that's the linear span of the first seven Hermit functions. So I understood, what, how can I understand this? And, the, and my understanding comes with the following picture. You have a big table, a round table of, with seven square meters, meaning seven dimensions or so. Then you have one broad column in the middle, which maybe has seven feet 
You can put them very far apart, then you have seven party tables, that's easy. You can put them at a reasonable distance, then they, the table will sit in a very stable way on these seven little piles. You can put them more and more narrow, it will still carry the table. The area is the same, but if somebody puts something on the border, the, the table will be unstable. So that's kind of my way of, you can look at the condition number of the representation, that will deteriorate more and more. So kind of, then it's interesting to say, when do I get already more or less the linear span of the first seven Hermit functions, but in the most stable way, because if I'm too far away, I don't get the space. If I'm too far inside, I'm not getting a stable representation. And I mention it because uh, this idea is really probably relevant for people who are doing solving, uh, sol solving the uh, Schrödinger equation or so. They would say, we have GABA expansions and we want to have the evolution of the GABA expansion and they somehow see that the Gauss atoms are deformed a little bit. And what they do is they use Hage turn wave packets which as I understand they are Hermit functions with the center moving in phase space to the positions. So they're saying I'm staying in the seven dimensional space but then somehow they have to go back in the after one time step to go to GABA expansion. That's in our reading of these things. And then you are continuing, and so you need both locally Hermit function or Gabor expansion, and that's very nice. W maybe uh, later on in MATLAB, maybe on Friday, I can show you some pictures about these things. So again, we have in functional analysis something which looks like a good substitute for linear independence and generating system, and it's called uh, a total set for generating and linear independence in the usual way, but there concepts which are having their use but they are having limited uh, things and we should go with these diagrams and now I'm just uh, telling you the story uh, what you find in the literature and how it translates into the diagram in, in a few words. If somebody is saying I'm interested for example I like cubic splines because we have used them already so then you can say well do we have a basis for the cubic spline so the Hilbert space of all quadratic uh, L2 functions which are having locally the shape of cubic polynomials glued together in a C2 manner. So it's a curve which is described by its local structure or and by, by how it's glued together and the global condition L2. Uh, then you can say, well, what is an easy example? We can take the convolution power number four of the box function and you have one such nice bump function which we produce again numerically in MATLAB. If you take this and you shift it, it's also such a function. So clearly, if you take L2 coefficients, it's very easy to show that these are square integrable functions. And then you have to verify, well, these are exactly all the functions that you can get. If somebody is giving you actually any L2 function, because we know how the biorthogonal re-spaces for the subspace looks like, we can take this color product of our L2 functions with this biorthogonal basis, which is a dual element in the space shifted around or so. So we get exactly for every position of a B spline, we get one coefficient. And that gives us an L2 function. And if it's a function which was in L2 and the cubic spline, it's a reproducing thing. If it was outside, it's the best approximation. Just as an exercise, if I would take step functions, you would say L2 functions integrated against the step function, the average value of the interval is of course the optimal coefficient. If you are already taking triangular function, you have to think a little bit or to compute the dual object. It's not exactly a scalar product with the triangular function. It's a kind of, uh, uh, well, piecewise linear function which tries to get the optimal biotogonality. I mean, it has to have scalar product one with the triangular function, but zero with the second, uh, zero with the third one, and in both directions. So it, it has some up and downs. Now assume again. Uh, this is the sequence space, L2. X is my Hilbert space. So I'm having uh, the, all the L2 functions here, but I want to embed my sequence space into this plane spaces by having here the range of this mapping. That's exactly the subspace, which I call X0 in this picture, is the subspace of all cubic spline functions in L2. And so what we really have is the diagram tells us 
this subspace, by choosing the coefficients in that basis, which is uniquely determined, it's not an orthonormal basis, but it's a, risk, a, a stable risk basis, things are in, the, in that closure if and only if they can be represented in a very reasonable way, point-wise, actually in the norm of amalgam space C0 L2, because locally we have nice functions, globally we have L2 behavior. So, so uh, we have this situation. That's actually a, a side remark which I think is, is quite useful. Um, I would say uh, Hans Triebel is uh, well known for his function spaces. In one of his recent papers was uh, introducing some terminology about different norms. So uh, one is, uh, I don't know, I think called admissible. That's more or less the norm that describes if something is finite, you're in the space, and if it's infinite, you're out of the space. So LP space definitions are very clear. The reservoir is integrable functions. You write the LP norm, the usual one. If a function has a finite norm, it's fine, and then you are in the LP space or not. Amalgam space is here, for example, you will say, well, I have told you we are talking about the closed subspace of L2, but I also told you about on that subspace, the L2 norm, which is kind of defining a big space, is equivalent to the amalgam norm. But it's very easy for you to write a function which is not a cubic spline, which is locally C0, and let's say a piecewise linear function, is not a cubic spline, obviously. So this norm equivalence can be used, but only locally in this territory, so to say, and he has kind of a geographic notation. Once you are in, in a certain region, let's say within Schengen area, certain rules apply, therefore it's not, it doesn't matter whether you have a passport or a personal document. Of course, if you're going outside the domain, if you're going, I don't know, if I would go to India and don't have my passport with me, it would be a big problem. So I think it's a very reasonable thing that we have in, in, in life. So the story is, such a diagram tells us we have an embedding. And now the other important thing is with the re spaces, you can say, okay, we're talking about a weakening of the concept of isomorphism. A basis tells us we have a Banach space of objects, distribution, functions, or so, and it's isomorphic to its coordinates, so a sequence space. And now we're saying, and that's sometimes forgotten, we're saying we have norm equivalence that's written here in this way, actually, the coefficients in L2 or the L2 norm of the cubic spline here. This is the coefficient here, and you can get back and forth. But the Banach, uh, the re spaces uh, definition has also this aspect that the upper part is important. Why is it important? Because if somebody is leaving this space, and you, you still can come back. So if somebody is doing some manipulations which are no problem in L2, so for example, um, you might do what you do when you do sampling theory. The algorithms in sampling theory you use also such, such <coughs> algorithms. You start with, an F, with a cubic spline function, for example. Then somebody is giving you samples. And then you say, OK, now I know the samples, and I know the function was in the spline up space. Then you try to say, well, can I fabricate some first approximation? You might say, I take a piecewise linear interpolation. I'm really starting through the sampling operator. I'm ending up here. And if I wouldn't be able to come back, I couldn't iterate. I couldn't run the algorithm. But if I have this reconstruction algorithm, I say, OK, I can project on the best approximating spline, then I could identify it, which means you're giving me data. I try to use the data to my best thing. Then because I can project, I can make some approximation. And then I can ask, well, my first approximation has some sampling values. You claim I would need other sampling values. So the given data, and I can compare it, which means I can feed back the difference into the algorithm, and I can improve my my thing, and if, the, if I can prove that this is a construction, I can do it. So I would say the, the irregular sampling algorithms very often use this idea that you have an isomorphism between a sequence space and a function, a closed subspace, which is, however, complemented. And whether you say you have a projection operator, and in the Banach space situation, it's not an orthogonal projection operator, it will be a, a general projection operator, of course. If you can project, you can make a reconstruction operator because then you can project on the range and make the identification. On the other hand, if somebody says, I have found a right inverse, no, what is it, a, um, a left inverse. So you have this operator R, which I would say is the synthesis operator. You start with the sequence and make 
a function from it. You do a linear combination and you produce a cubic piece plan. I'm giving to you and asking, well, do you know how to find the coefficients? And you would say, well, I use the, the reconstruction. I make the coefficients by using the bidirectional system. So you can say, well, even if I have destroyed this a little bit, I'm here, I take these coefficients and I come back. If I don't destroy anything, I should come back and it should be identity. So first I have synthesized and afterwards I have taken coefficients. And now you can imagine that the same story uh, and, uh, and with change, changed roles of instead of starting with a, with a coefficient space, we are doing now the opposite. We're taking scalar products. And that's usually the usual way, and, but I really try to, to do this, uh, that people say we are now in the space of L2 functions or even distributions. And now we, we have a coefficient mapping. C is now really a coefficient mapping. We have multiplied with a prime. We're taking a lot of coefficients because we cannot store analog signals, but we can take coefficients and we store the coefficients in some basis. Maybe we have problems to get the exact coefficients, so we rather try to store a slightly redundant family of maybe not so precise values. A good example again would be we can take sampling as a prototype for a finite dimensional setting. You're saying, I have a, a cubic polynomial and you're allowed to take the mouse and sample and use the uh, uh, values from seven sampling values. So we would say, okay, it should be great to have seven sampling values to reconstruct the four unknown coefficients. Or you could say we have a rectangular matrix. But because you were not very precise in your jittering, maybe you have a vector in R7, which is not the sampling value of those seven positions, which is correct. Or you may have not exact information about these values. But still, you can take the pseudo inverse. And if you feed that into the, it says, well, given this data, I think this is the best guess. Formally, you would say, due to Lagrange interpolation polynomials, the range of all cubic polynomials within those seven positions must be four dimensional space of R7. So if you give me any vector in R7, like the ones from your mouse, you can project it onto this four dimensional space. I mean, that's kind of, again, the picture then there will be at least one solution. But because four correct values already give uniqueness, this is uniquely determined in this case. So in this case, you can say, well, then you take the best fit, the, you, you have made the ma system consistent and you get the polynomial. So you would say it's like linear regression. You have a cloud of points and you try the best fitting straight line. If you go to higher orders, it's exactly pseudo inverse again and a very good example to, to for, for students. And now, this is the story of frames. This is Hilbert space, this is L2, and you are saying the mapping is injective, and you describe it again with the norm equivalence, and uh, uh, the norm equivalence look like this, that your family, countable family typically, is having something such that the range is, is fine. Why do I mention and, and emphasize this, this diagram so much? Because there is a danger when you go from, from uh, Hilbert spaces to Banach spaces that you forget about the diagram and that you would say it's an isomorphism. And a good example again is, uh, I mean, Charlie Gröchenig was introducing after our joint work uh, the concept of Banach frames. Uh, so I'm just saying, take the same diagram and say, what if these are Banach spaces? And you can say, I have a Banach space here and you have a sequence of coefficients, so somebody is measuring in a linear way, a sequence of linear functionals is establishing something like a frame in a Banach space setting if this is going from the abstract Banach space to a sequence space. So there are some notions, actually there are many papers on this subject or so. Some notions say, for example, a P-frame is where you have an isomorphism between LP instead of L2 or so. But it's just norm equivalence or so. If you have this here. Now I would say, uh, the, the downside of such an approach is that you can easily produce even, even the, what, what, what uh, Charlie Grochenik calls the Banach frames with the diagram by saying I have a diagram and now I go to subspace. And to give you a counterexample that I think is instructive to about the weakness of the current definition of Banach frame um, is the following. So Banach frames for you should be something, read this in the setting of Banach frames. So 
you have an embedding of a, of a Banach space into a closed and complemented subspace. Complemented means you have a projection. So <coughs> instead of isomorphism to the full space, it's not just isomorphism to a subspace. That would be the inequality. But the diagram already tells you it's a complemented subspace. And I'm telling you that's nice. In most of the cases, you can do certain things. But even that, I don't like. And the example is, again, a classical, which fits nice to the course. You can take the torus. And we start with the classical autonomous system Fourier series expansion. So you're saying, I'm having L2, and it corresponds to little l2. So the diagram is established, and even it's an isomorphism or so. And then I'm saying, what if I take a subspace of L2, a Banach subspace, and then you can take LP with P larger than 2, so maybe between 2 and infinity with finite, so it's no problem with density of test function or so. How can I produce an appropriate sequence space that uh, even I have an isomorphism? And I can just say, well, I take FLP. I take the distribution of Fourier transform of all the things. So all the coefficients that I need so that the Fourier expansion understood in the distributional sense represent these LP functions. Is it a one-to-one -one correspondence? Yes, because in distribution theory you, have, you still have uniqueness or so. Is this a nice space? Well, it depends on what you want to do. Is it a Banach space? Yes, yeah, I take the norm with me, no problem. Are unit vectors in this space? Yes. And are they dense? Yes, I can approximate. But what is the typical situation that we are doing in wavelet theory, in time frequency analysis, in, in uh, compressed sensing and all these things? We say, now we have these coefficients and we manipulate them. For example, we throw away the small ones. And there are very nice or interesting examples, which are not the ones that you expect first, but uh, Tem Professor Temlikov uh, from South Carolina or, and also Russia. He was uh, some years ago making some papers. I have the references, but I don't know the exact details or so, saying, well, you can take, you can find functions, I think I mentioned this maybe already, where the Fourier coefficients are such that they are having values which are oscillating around the value. And they are creating oscillations which uh, uh, kill each other, so to say. In the supernorm, you would say there they're, they're are positive and negative contributions, and overall, the, the thing is small. So if you choose certain thresholds, half of it is surviving. So there is no cancellation anymore. And therefore, you are, you are having something which is a little bit bigger. Now, of course, people are pushing this to the limit. So the, the worst thing that can happen is the following. You have a sequence of thresholds. They go to zero at a certain speed. And each time you make a threshold worse, he has a contribution which for that particular threshold lets, uh, destroys the, the cancellation properties even more. So while you're making the threshold of the coefficient smaller, you have more and more trouble. So it's even divergent. It's not that it's not convergent, it's even divergent. You can di make the divergence with some speed depending on your epsilon. So that's kind of really uh, done in, in much detail or so. So what I think is, is really important that we should say a little bit more about this uh, synthesis mapping. And in all the examples that are done in practice in, in irregular sampling of band-limited function, irregular sampling of spline type functions, GABA analysis, wavelet analysis, you actually have this property, meaning that this is a sequence space and we have a reconstruction mapping. And this reconstruction mapping allows you to put in a unit vector. So if you again think you have a matrix you would have the pseudo inverse of a unit vector that would be just one of the rows of the matrix. You would say, okay, I have now, you give me seven coordinates to represent the cubic polynomials. So practically you would say, well, like Lagrange interpolation, but not precise. I have too many functions. I cannot have uh, uh, seven cubic polynomials which add up, but I can have seven polynomials so that if you give me seven, seven, seven values of, of a polynomial and I glue that together, I get a cubic polynomial with four coefficients. And it's a more stable way than just saying throw away from these seven values three of them. That's another joke that I like to say. If people say, well, if you have too many sampling values, throw away some of them, then you're in the situation of a square matrix or so. And I'm saying, yeah, of course, I'm throwing away the bad samplings. Just you have to tell me what the bad samples are. And that's, uh, of course, in practice, not, not, not the feasible way. So normally, you are hoping to have uh, a certain percentage of additional sampling values uh, 
uh, because you might have limited precision, limited knowledge about the situation or so. And then the most stable way, um, which is not so sensitive to outliers, not so sensitive to little errors in the in the quantization level, I mean the values that you put in, in the position where you assume these samples are taken and so on. And uh, I think I am close to the timing, um, maybe just telling you that when we then now go to this banach gelfand triple situation, we can still take the same situation we are uh, having errors and we have prototypical banach gelfand triple which is L1, L2, L infinity. We have other examples like S0, S0 prime and in the middle L2. And the only thing we have to know is we have to know, and I will stop with this slide here, we have to know what these errors then mean. So they are not just, they're like fat errors which have three layers. If you have through two such objects, now here I have a very bad visible green kernel, red Hilbert space in the middle and the dual space outside, then I would <coughs> say a homomorphism, that's the basic thing, is something respecting the topology and, and the structure. So they're all Banach spaces, so the mapping has to be from the big to the big one or maybe defined on the small one and properly extended to the big one. Moving the small into the small, the Hilbert space into the Hilbert space, the big one into the big one. But we need, and that's very useful, the weak star convergence. So weak star convergence things should go to the weak star convergence things here. And then you can have a situation where you even have an isomorphism. Then you say, okay, then uh, if this is little l2, that might be that you allow that you move from unit vectors to a system of vectors which is a re basis. More, most of the time we are hoping that it's even unitary at the Hilbert space level. It's not meaningful at inner and out outer level. Of course, unitary you can see already on the inner level. So the fundamental ro lo relation for the Fourier transform is something you see unitarity here, you extend it here, you have l2 to l2 or something like this. But it's important that you have these three things. And so we have now a terminology, homomorphisms are mappings, isomorphisms, or you have uh, frames in the spirit of banach gelfand triples. You have the diagram, but each node is now a triple of spaces. And we will see that this really occurs in a very natural way in Gabor analysis, and we, I will try to talk about this in the next part. So we can take a break, and sorry for going a little bit over time. Thank you.